All right. So I'm gonna, I'm just <clears throat> setting it up to go, oh, it looks like it is going on the Facebook. I will give you all a couple, a minute or so to come in. And for those of you, and I'll repeat this um, again in a couple minutes, because um, some people come on late, but for those of you that haven't been here before, how this works is I will kind of walk you through an exercise if we have time, but I first really want to answer any of your questions. So there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So click on that and then type in your question and that comes directly to me. Um, if you put it in the chat, I may or may not see it. So the best way to get your question answered is if you put it in the Q&A and then we'll start going through those and get you some answers. So before I get started on that, there is something we talked a little bit last time about, um, we didn't really talk about it in this way, but a thought error of someone had asked about, well, like, how do I have more willpower? Like, I'm just a person that doesn't have a lot of willpower. Like, I don't know how to get more willpower. And what we talked through was for her, she says, I don't have willpower as if she's just like reporting the news. She just talks about it like, right, like I'm just a person that doesn't have willpower. And I shared with her last time that that is just a thought she's having. Like she has a sentence that runs through her mind that talks about her not having willpower and how our brain works is that then once like she's practiced that for so long that then she goes out to find all of the evidence to support that she doesn't have willpower. And so all she does is to continue to perpetuate that for herself. So I want to talk to you a little bit about thought errors, as we call them, and really bring some awareness to some that you might be having for yourself. So Tara, is that how you say your name? Uh, hi, Tara. And I see Miriam and Danielle. And I see Claire, amazing, I see a bunch, of, so I see more people coming in. And so I will, um, I'm gonna first answer any questions that you have. So again, to get your question answered, if you haven't been to any of these before, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, click on the button, type in your question, and I'll answer that. It's easier than for me to read through the Q or the, um, comments. And if you're watching this on Facebook, the way to come and get your questions answered is you have to actually come into the Zoom room. And so if you get all, if you get my emails, you will have the link there. And if you don't, then you'll need to go through the six day training. And that's how you'll get the emails for this. So I am going to go through the Q&A first, and then I'm going to walk you through something for you to start thinking about. So, okay. Tara said, how do I... Is it Tara or Tara? Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Okay, how do I stay consistent in exercise and food? And so I'm gonna do a little refresher kind of for everyone, but for you, I want you to think about, put this up a little bit. Um, I want you to think about why you aren't. Like if you can think about a specific time recently that you had decided, okay, I'm going to exercise or okay, I'm going to eat this. And then you didn't do what you planned on doing. Like, can you think about a really specific time that that happened for you? And then we'll walk through how to really understand why you're not doing what you want to do. Because if you have been through, and I don't know where you are, if you've been through the six-day training, if you've looked at them, if you haven't looked at them, wherever you are, but how I coach all of my clients is I help them really understand the root cause of all of it. So we're, we don't focus on just like willpowering our way through new habits and new actions without also simultaneously working on the thought. So how I approach it is we have all of these thoughts that are going through our mind, and I'll walk you through it for you specifically, that drive all of our action. And from that action, when it's something we don't want or it's not preferred, most coaching and most kind of diets and programs and all of that, all it tries to do is just override the action rather than actually rewiring your brain so that the action starts to become effortless. Because if you remember, so if you can 
Tara, if you can think about a specific example and put it back in the q and I'll kind of walk you through this. And if you don't, that's okay. I'll walk you through. I'll just kind of make one up to kind of give you more insight into that for you. But when we think about the model, so there are circumstances in the world, and then we have thoughts about them, and this is where all of our power is, that then produce an emotion, a feeling that we're feeling in our body and all of our action and inaction comes from emotions. And if you've heard me kind of talk about it before, we're often conditioned to believe that like we, we don't even talk about emotions. That's just like the soft stuff. And that's totally how I used to think, but really understanding that all of our feelings drive everything we do. We're either seeking a different feeling and that's driving our action or we're trying to avoid a feeling or we're, you know, when I think about even like losing weight, right? We're, we often think about like being motivated or feeling lazy or um, having dread or guilt or shame or like all of that is driving what we're doing all of the time. And we always have an emotion in our body. I was actually getting coached myself yesterday. So I get coached multiple times a week um, for various, they each have different purposes, but this was more of just a personal coaching. And we were talking about how we always have an emotion in our body, but they just start to take different shapes. They're like, she described it as like shape shifters. And I just loved thinking about it that way because there's always an emotion present in our body. And we may be more or less aware or more or less in tune to it, but it's always there. It's not like it just goes away. We can never eat our way out of it. There's always an emotion present. And so when you're thinking about staying consistent, and exercise and food, and then I'm going to walk you through how I teach my clients to start to do that rewiring for them, is to really see and get really specific with an example of when you weren't consistent, when you had decided in advance you were going to be. Because when we decide what, that we're going to, I'm just going to say exercise, I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to work out. We decide that with our prefrontal cortex, that's our very human part of our brain that thinks about planning, thinks about the future. That's like, yep, I really want to get up in the morning and exercise. And then the alarm clock goes off and our primitive brain is like, absolutely not. I don't want to do that. We'll do it some other time. Not today. I'll start tomorrow. All of the things. And so a lot of this work is retraining our brain to, to not allow that primitive brain in the moment have all of the power. And so if you think about exercise and particular, I'm just going to use that example. I'm going to say you decided you were going to, I'll use maybe my own example. So I get up a couple times a week. I have a different um, exercise schedule, um, different days of the week, but I consistently do the same thing, like consistently do the same exercise, the same day of the week. It's not always in the morning. It's not always at the same time. And so for me, I get up at five o'clock in the morning. So let's say I decided, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go to my exercise program. So then let's say the five, there's a five o'clock alarm that goes off. And for you, Tara, as you're doing this, put your, whatever your action is in this line here. So you would put Let's just say you don't get up. So I don't get up. I don't exercise. Maybe I sit in bed half asleep. That's usually what I do. So then what you want to understand so that we can change your action, so that we can change you getting out of bed is not to just force it with willpower, but we want to understand why you're not. Because when we can really truly understand why we're not, okay. I'm just reading, sorry. I'm reading a response. Let me read it out loud to you. Okay. Oh, you're from Ireland. Amazing. That's where my husband grew up. Um, I try to diet and exercise on a daily basis, but I feel defeated before I even start. My motivation is nil. I have the best intentions, but it becomes a procrastination. I've dieted and tried to have done a sort of plan most of my life. Yeah, so what often happens for 
almost all of us that have tried all of the things, right? I've tried all the diets, all the exercise programs. I tried to willpower my way through is when we're trying to do that, when we're trying to force it without doing it this way, without really understanding what's happening in our mind, we're trying to rely on so much energy and effort all of the time. And I'll show you why with this example. So I'm going to use your feeling. So you say you feel defeated before you even start. And if you can think about the exact thought that causes you to feel defeated, and it might even be, it might even not be your alarm clock. It might even be just you think about exercising. It might just be the thought of whatever you decided. Maybe it's a bar class. Maybe it's yoga. Maybe it's walking. Maybe it's running. Whatever you decided you were going to do. Like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to run. Tomorrow I'm going to go for a walk. And when you think about that, you often have a thought that causes you to feel defeated. What a lot of people are thinking when they feel defeated is that it's not going to matter anyways. And that's why we will feel defeated. But I want you to think about for you particularly, if you can think like what is going through your mind that causes you to feel defeated? And it's always a sentence going through your mind. It's always a thought. So it is not going to matter anyways. So it could be, let's say it's the five o'clock alarm. Let's say it's like the thought of like going for a walk, right? So when you are thinking about, and I'm just going to stick with a particular example, because we often want to like generalize and make it this big in all of the areas. But the only way to really start to unpack that is to get like really specific with one example. And what you will notice is you have that same thought in many areas. And so that's why it can feel like this big thing, but it's often a common set of thoughts that you have and you apply but just to like various different things, whether it's your eating plan, whether it's your exercise program, whether it's getting your work done, whether it's doing laundry, whether it's watching the kids, whatever, it's often a very similar pattern that's happening. So when you think about going for a walk, let's say, or whatever your exercises of choice, and what would be really helpful for you is for you to just like either rewatch this or like fill this out for you on your own is then you may have the thought, okay, well, it's not going to matter anyways. That's how I used to feel about a lot of exercise is like, I'm going to get up and do it. And then I'm just going to binge at the end of the night anyway. So it's not even going to matter for me that I exercise. So like, what's the point? Like, there's no point. And then we would feel really defeated. And then we'd be like, all right, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to follow through, even though I decided that's what I was going to do. Maybe I'm going to sleep. Maybe I'm going to watch TV. Maybe I'm going to go on Facebook, whatever I'm going to do. And then the end result is. I don't give myself the opportunity to even see if it matters. So you're just like proving to you and or like it doesn't matter. So let me get a new marker. So what you're doing what I want you to see, and this is why it's so important, is that we create then this belief system around whatever it is. But in this case, exercise, like, see, it doesn't matter. But it's not because it doesn't necessarily actually matter, but it's because you've just been practicing that sentence in your mind over and over and over again. So I want you to get really specific with a particular example and it works best if you can think of something that happened in the last two or three days and think about what was going through my mind when that happened, when I didn't follow through in the way I wanted to and what was happening for me, like what was going through my head. And cause then what happens and what we can start to see is that I have a thought. It's not going to matter anyways. And it might feel really real and really true to you only because you've practiced it for so long. Sorry, I'm holding on to my my microphone pack because I'm wearing a dress, but you have that thought. It's not going to matter anyways. And then your brain will prove that true always because you feel defeated. And when we feel defeated, we're like, absolutely not. Am I getting out of bed? Absolutely not. Am I going to go for a walk after I put my kids down? There's no way I'm going to go work out after I worked a full day, all of the things. And so 
then when we do all of that and we don't exercise, we're just proving to ourselves, like, see, it doesn't matter. See, it doesn't matter. And what we are so conditioned and socialized to believe that the answer is, is that we need more willpower or that we're lazy or that we need more discipline or we need more self-control or we need to just be more diligent. We believe that all of that is the answer. But when we think about willpower in particular, willpower is trying to just override your action. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to try to just override my action, my like natural inclination to not want to do it with doing it. And so we can do that for a period of time and we might be able to see a little bit of success with it. But what we're doing is we're not actually understanding the thought that's causing it. And so then it's like, it takes so much energy and effort and willpower to override our natural inclination because of our thought that we eventually give up. And so what I want you to see is how powerful it is to think a thought different from what you're thinking so that you can help yourself start to exercise or help yourself start to um, change how you're eating. And then I'm going to give you a couple of my thoughts on exercise in particular. Um, but I, it's like, it's so, we think at times like, oh, there's something intrinsically wrong with me. Like, I just am a person. Like, I think it was Rowena last week that said, oh, I, like, I just need more willpower. We talk about it as if it's just like a, it's like a, a trait. Like, I have red hair. I have blue eyes. I have no willpower. But that's not true at all. It's just something we've practiced over and over and over again. And it, our brain will always try to prove it true. So until we start to see that it's an optional thought we're having and it doesn't serve us, we can start to let it go by practicing something thing in it that will get us towards the future. Okay. So you also said, I seem to always self-sabotage before I even get there. And then my confidence and self-esteem will be on the floor. I look at everybody else and it seems so easy for them. I've only gained weight when I had kids. They're 13 and 19. I do comfort eat and stress eat. I really want to get a handle on that. So here's what be my suggestion to you. And I'm going to go through this a little bit for everyone else as well. And I see some more people that have come in since we started. So just a reminder, if you haven't been to any of these calls before, welcome to some amazingness. If you have a question in particular, put that in the Q&A box. It's easier for me to see there than the comment, the chat box. So there's a little Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can put it there. If you're watching this on Facebook and you're not in the Zoom room, you have to come into the Zoom room to get your questions answered. Okay, so... And I'm just going to answer Danielle's question quick. Um, so the C, Danielle, is a circumstance. So the circumstance, and I have a cheat sheet in the first day of the six-day training, and I kind of walk you through this in more detail. The C is the fact. The C is something we would all agree on. The C is just the circumstance that's outside of us, that if we took you know, a thousand people, we would all agree. There's no sub subjectivity. It's, there's no opinion. There's no interpretation. It just is what is. And so, um, like in this example, we wouldn't, I wouldn't even put necessarily exercise in the C line because everyone would maybe think about that differently. And we want to get really specific, like as specific as possible so we can really tap into what's happening in our mind. And so like five o'clock alarm is a pretty specific, there's no like really subjectivity in that. Okay. So I'm coming back to Tara's response here. Okay, I always seem to self-sabotage. So, okay, in particular with, because you said I want to stay consistent in exercise and food. Sorry, I just have some hairs in the way. Is with this, before I move on and talk about exercise in particular, is to see like, and Tara, respond if you can. Can you see that like you have a thought that's producing you to feel defeated? And I want you to just stick with defeated because that's what we started with. And it's really powerful to just stick with one until it really sinks in because then it's like once you can grasp it there, then you can apply it to all of the other areas. But when you feel defeated, like really ask yourself what's happening in your mind that causes you to feel defeated because our brains want it to be something outside of us. Our brains aren't trained until we train them to think about the thought we're having that may or may not be true. And then to just ask ourselves, not from a place of judgment or shame, 
but just does that serve me to continue believing that? And before we end, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about thought errors, and I think that will help you out as well. So if you want to create a, um, a different outcome for yourself, there's two things you can do. Well, there's a couple things, but the two things are, right, like you can willpower your way so you can feel defeated and then try to override feeling defeated with willpower, with like, I'm going to just do it anyways. And it can be beneficial to do that. And then afterwards, you check in with yourself and you're like, oh, see, actually, that was amazing. Actually, I feel great. And you just use that experience to build your belief in that you love exercising. And we can do that for a little bit, but that's not what we're going to do to sustain us to continue to exercise for the rest of our lives. So because we started with exercise, I'm going to give you like my thought about how I exercise consistently. So I, there's a couple things. I have two little kids. So I have a three-year-old and 11-month-old. I exercise five to six days a week, pretty much all the time, always, all throughout my pregnancy until the day I went into labor, like postpartum as soon as I could, because I just love it. And it's because I've changed how I think about it. I used to hate exercising. I used to like force myself, but it would be like this whole big thing that I felt like I would spend like an hour or two hours just like getting the oomph to like go do it. And so now I just do it all of the time because I just love it. And so that's why I don't want you to focus on like trying to willpower your way there is that you can do that for a little bit, but it's not going to be sustainable and it's not going to be lifelong. And one of the reasons that it's so easy for me now is because I've separated exercise from losing weight. So when I'm working with a client in particular, when we're talking about losing weight and she's like, I need to go to the gym more and I need to do this and I need to count calories and I need to do all these things and I have all these ideas. And like, I just like, if I just could exercise more, I would lose weight. And my response to that is always absolutely not. You must separate exercise from losing weight because when we think about exercising, especially if we're trying to willpower our way there, the amount of energy and effort it takes for us to willpower our way to exercise usually comes with a reverse effect on the back end, whether it's overeating or it's um, just saying like F it or not sleeping. We don't embrace it in a way that serves us when we have all of the pressure of losing weight on exercise. So what I always tell everyone is you must first take the pressure of losing weight off of exercise. And it may sound counterintuitive, but I promise you will lose weight so much more quickly and in a sustained way because then what happens if you're I get my babies up and I can't, and I can't work out in the morning. I used to be like this, like anxious little like person that was just like, "Oh my gosh, no, I'm going to gain weight and like it's all going to go to shit and all of the things." But that's only because I had losing the pressure of exercise or the pressure of losing weight on to exercise. And so then I was also never able to develop a really healthy, good relationship with exercise where I just liked to exercise for exercise's sake. And so if you're really working on losing weight and working on your overeating, I want you to whoop, like push exercise over here for a minute and spend all of that mental energy and effort on overeating. And then when it comes to exercise, all I want you to do is pick something. If it's really important to you, pick something that's easy. Don't pick what's going to burn the most calories. Like we're not, we don't need to run. We don't need to like do a triathlon, like all of that. Pick what you enjoy doing that will be easy for you to start. So if you have some of that self-sabotage that you said and feeling defeated before I even start, I want you to pick something that you actually enjoy. Like for me, I go through different phases of my life where I enjoy different things. I went through a yoga phase. I went through doing workouts at home. And now I love going to bar classes. I also love just walking and listening to a podcast. So do something for you that you enjoy doing right now today. You don't have to do any thought work to get there, but you just genuinely enjoy it. And if you can't think of anything, start with just going for a walk. Going for a walk, listening to a book. Going for a walk, listening to a podcast. Going for a walk, not doing anything, but take the pressure of losing weight 
off of exercise. I promise it will become so much more freeing and liberating and you will actually exercise more. And then separate out those two and then spend that energy and effort on food and really understanding what's happening in your mind when you're overeating. Okay, so, oh, Tara also said, I feel not worthy or not deserving. So this is so interesting that I, it's like, it's like there's so many things that I just like, continue to like learn and internalize in just a deeper way because I also, I get coached multiple times a week, like I said in the beginning for various different parts of my life, but really that feeling of unworthiness or I don't deserve it or I'm not enough or some form of those sentences, every single person has them. Every single person. Even the most successful people, I will watch, for example, uh, multiple seven-figure earners have be coached, or I will watch someone who is at their goal weight, or I will watch someone who has something that we would look at and be like, that's amazing, right? And they're so kind and generous and all these things. But at the core of every single thing, if we continue to dig and dig and dig as to why you're having those thoughts that aren't serving you, it's always some version of I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. And what was the other thing you said? I'm not worthy. So those will always be there. And I'll just write them up here. I, why do I, my, so I am not good enough. I am unworthy. I don't deserve it. deserve it. Those, all of those thoughts, first of all, are thoughts that we have as humans. And it's a sentence that goes through our mind that I don't know anyone that doesn't have some version of those thoughts. And so what I want you to do is when you see things like that, to maybe ask yourself some questions like, okay, if I'm not good enough, who is good enough? If I'm not worthy, what makes someone worthy? If I don't deserve it, okay, then who does deserve it? And get really specific on what do they have? Like, how old are they? What do they look like? What colors their hair? Like, it causes your brain to see that you're having a thought that doesn't really make any sense. Because when I think about, sorry, I nipped my finger in something earlier. Um, when I think about like worthiness and deserving something. And I think I talk about this in the fifth day of the six day training with the scale that we often tie our weight, our number on the scale, the amount of money we make, all of that to our worthiness and what we deserve as a human being, like our intrinsic worth as a human. And so what I want you to ask yourself is, okay, if you, so you said you had two children. When you had a newborn baby, did you believe any of that about a baby? That they're not good enough, they're not worthy, they don't deserve, fill in the blank, right? No, we never think that about a baby. But somewhere along the line, we then make that, we have those thoughts about ourselves, And even ask yourself, like, what age was I that I remember starting to think those thoughts? And for most of us, we can kind of come back to an age. Like for me, it was maybe 10-ish which is so interesting, right? Like what did it just like one day change and all of a sudden I went from worthy to not worthy, but we start to develop that at some point in our life. But I want you to remember is that every human being like is worthy no matter what, that your worthiness and your value is completely detached from the scale. It's completely detached from how much you weigh. It's completely detached from what you do and what you don't do. And how much money you make, all of that. Your worthiness as a human being is always intact. And with that thought process, then when you have those thoughts come up of like, I don't deserve it, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, what I do and what I work on with my clients is, okay, I'm having that thought. It's kind of like you have this conversation where you're not trying to get rid of it. We often like are like, I just want a new one. I just like don't want it to be there. But just recognize that all humans have some variation of that thought. It will always be there. But it's the difference between that thought driving the car 
And like, if you imagine being in a car and that thought, like being in the car, I don't deserve it. And determining where you go and like whether you put your seatbelt on or not and what radio station you're picking and like turning the car and doing the steering and like, right? If you, it's the difference between that thought driving the car and just being in the back seat. So what we want to do is not like throw it out of the car because it will always be there. You will like be exhausted trying to get rid of that. It's just be like, okay, you can be there, but it just isn't going to run my life. And so when I have that thought come up and I still do, even with my weight at times, I'm just like, thank you, thought, brain. Like that's just a sentence that goes through my mind, but I don't have to like latch onto it and believe it in a way that prevents me from moving forward. So if you have any comments um, back on that, Tara, just put them back and I will answer those. Okay. So I, a couple more people have come in. So if you're joining us, welcome. Sorry, that was a little ding on my computer. Welcome. And if you have a question, you can put anything you want help with in the Q&A box. And that comes directly to me and that's easier for me to read than the chats. So if you have any questions, put them there and I will answer them. And I think this will help as well for you is that I want to talk to you all about thought errors. So thought errors are things, sentences that run through our mind. So they're thoughts. So if you remember again from the model, So these are circumstances, these are the facts, and then these trigger thoughts, and this is where all of our, oops, I didn't mean to write that, thoughts, and this is where all of our power is because we can change our thoughts. These are the sentences in our mind, and these always produce feelings, and all of our feelings drive our actions, right? Actions is our behavior. And all of our actions and inactions lead to the results that we have. So always what we're thinking, because it drives our feelings, our actions, and all of our actions create our, creates our results, like our thoughts always create the results that we have around us. And so that's why Again, it's so powerful to see what am I thinking and is that serving me in the results I want to create and really understanding from that perspective what's going on for you so that you don't have to continue to chase after what you're trying to create with more and more and more willpower because all of that is focused on our actions without changing our thoughts. And so when you're trying to force your actions without actually changing what's happening in your mind, you end up with this battle all of the time because they often conflict. And so what I want for you to do is to change your thoughts so that the action becomes effortless and the action becomes easy. So with thought errors, thought errors are kind of like what Tara just asked about not being worthy and not deserving that they're just an error in our brain. It's an actual like error that makes no sense. It's kind of like we have this thought that for most of us, we've never questioned before. No one is like, oh yeah, okay, in seventh grade, you learn thought work. You learn how to manage your mind, right? No one teaches us how to do this. Like I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even know for most of my life that my thoughts were optional. I could change them. And that's where all of my power is. And that's what was creating all of my feelings. Like, especially for me with my anxiety, I was like, hang on, what? I could manage my mind and not experience nearly as much anxiety. I was like, I can't believe no one told me this before. So really understanding all of these thoughts, but we often have these thought errors. And it's kind of like you have wa been walking around believing like two plus four equals five. And you're like, yep, two plus four equals five. Two plus four equals five. And then someone gets out two things and someone gets out four things and you're like going to add them up and you're like, what the fuck? That equals six. Like, how come no one told me that before? Like, that is a thought error. It's just like, you've been believing two plus four equals five, two plus four equals five, as if it was a universal truth. And then when you bring your awareness to it, you're just like, oh, like clearly that isn't what happens? Two plus four equals six. And as soon as you have that like instant realization, it can completely change 
so much for you. And so I want to walk you through how to think about thought errors, especially when it comes to food and especially when it comes to your thoughts about yourself when you think about losing weight and changing your relationship with food and changing your relationship with yourself. So as I go through this, put some of the ones that you have that come to your mind. I'm going to give you some examples, but put some of the ones that you think about yourself that feel really real and really true. And I'll walk you through those, put them in the Q and A. So here's a couple that people we often believe like are really real and really true. And all be, even though all thoughts are optional, what I want you to also get in the pattern of is asking yourself, does it serve me to continue to believe this? So it's not about finding like the right thought or the wrong thought or this is bad or this is good. I just think about it as there's all these thoughts. Which ones serve me and which ones don't serve me? So I'm not trying to find like the perfect one or the right one, but just like what serves me and what serves me in the moment and what doesn't. And we have like 60,000 thoughts a day. And so how we manage our mind is by continually redirecting it towards where we want to be. So, okay, I'm just going to write down a couple thought errors that people often have. Okay. Celebration means food and drink. I need food to decompress. I just can't be by myself. I just like food more than other people. I just, I don't have any self-control. <laughs> Chocolate is an essential part of my life. Right? So there are tons and tons and tons of these, but I want you to ask yourself, what are some thoughts that you have that feel really real and really true, but that might not be serving you? So make a list of thoughts that creates an unwanted desire for food and that create you ending up overeating. So I want you to think like really specifically for you. Okay. What time of day, if there's a particular time of day, most people struggle in the evening. And so if it's the evening, like in the evening, I've eaten dinner, the kids are asleep, maybe I need to work a little bit more, maybe I'm done working. What's happening for you that you often find yourself eating? Like what's going through your mind? For me, it was like, now I get to relax with food. Now I get to enjoy myself. And that meant food. I need food to decompress. I don't know how to handle my anxiety without food all of the different things. And like, then for a while it was wine. And what is it for you that's going through your mind and put some of those in the Q and A and we can talk through some of them. What's going through your mind that's causing you to feel desire for food. So when we think about each one of these, that celebration means food and drink, that I need food to decompress, that I just can't be by myself without food, that I just like food more than other people, I don't have any self-control, and chocolate is an essential part of my life. Like we would see in society how like true all of those thoughts seem. Like if you're a child growing up, like, all of those thoughts you probably would have seen evidence for at some point. And so for most of us, we've never questioned how we think about food. We've never questioned how we see ourselves. We've never questioned our self-control or discipline or willpower or anything like that. We've just kind of adopted the thoughts from our childhood and then our young adulthood and then as an adult, and we've never questioned any of it before. So they can all feel really real and true, but so often they create desire to eat that then we end up eating. 
And it's not because there's something wrong with us. It's not because there's something wrong with necessarily how we were raised or anything like that. But like, we just have this thought we've never questioned before. And so ask yourself, what are some of those thoughts that you have that feel really real and really true? Because then I'm just walk you through an example here. We just want to start to question them and see that their thoughts that are optional that we don't need to have, especially if they're not serving you. So for example, I'm going to make this one super simple. So the thought I just like food more than other people is a thought many people tell me or like food just tastes too good or some version of this. And so you would put in your circumstance, it's like a, you're again, like you're talking about yourself, like I've got red hair. I just like food more than other people. So I would say, okay, Laura. And then I'd be like, yep, I just like food more than other people. But what that promotes for me, it's like Laura plus food almost. Okay. What that promotes for me is desire to eat. Like, think about if you are thinking, I just like food more than other people, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about eating. You have a desire to eat food, especially if you see food in front of you or you're at a party or you're around other people eating and you're like, I just like food more than other people. I just like food more than other people. What you do is you create all of this desire to eat when you're not hungry or you create the desire to keep eating beyond where you want to be satisfied and you overeat. And then what you're doing is you're proving it true. I eat more than you want to. And so then you're like, see, I just like food more than other people. But that's all coming from what you've been telling yourself for so long, that I just like food more than other people. And that thought is what's causing you to overeat. It's not that there's something wrong with you or there's something like intrinsic about you of like my hair color and I just like food more than other people. It's that you've been practicing that thought that now you have this belief about yourself that you like food more than other people. And so what I want you to see is that that thought is completely optional. You could not have that thought. I used to have the thought, well, like food just tastes so good for me or I just like really need food and I like food more than other people. And now I never think that about myself. It just doesn't serve me. Okay, so I'm going to go here and see what else is in here. Okay, Tara also responded back. I get super anxious and bored. I'm fine up until evening time. So for those of you watching, if you have a thought that produces that desire to eat, that you want to challenge and question that you just think about yourself, put that in the Q&A and we'll walk through it. And so Tara, for your example, it is almost always in the evening when we struggle. And why that happens is because we haven't changed, if we're using this example, we haven't changed the thought, I just like food more than other people. And so let's say we've been busy throughout our day and right, most of us don't wake up. This is actually another good way to think about it. When you think about waking up in the morning, are you thinking about food right away? For most people, it's a no. They're not thinking about stuffing their face right away. Like for me in the morning, even though I'd maybe feel anxiety, I wasn't thinking about eating all of the things, even though I did in the evening. And so when we talk about ourselves with food and our relationship with food and our relationship with ourselves, we're always like, okay, I just like food more than other people and pick whatever it is for you. But that feels really real and really true. But what I want you to see is that you're not overeating in the morning. You're maybe not even overeating throughout the day. Maybe it's just in the evening. But if that was like a, like a something intrinsic in you, if that was just like a part of you that would never change or never be different, you'd be overeating all day, every day. You would wake up with the thought, I just like food more than other people. And you would want to be eating. And you would just carry that with you all the time throughout the day because that was just like having red hair. Like I have red hair. I just like food more than other people. And you'd always be doing that. But there are times throughout your day that you're not thinking about overeating because you're just not having the thought. It's not because it's something inside of you. If it was something inside of you that could never change, you would be doing it all day, every day, because that's what's driving it. But what I want you to see is there are thoughts that come in and out. 
And for some of us, we've just practiced them so often, especially in the evening, that then it can feel really real and really true, but it's not. It's just something that we've conditioned our brain to believe that it just starts to think the thought on autopilot. And so to get out of that, we have to bring our awareness to what is the thought we're having and then direct it to what we want to be having and what we want to be creating. And so in the evening, why this happens so often is because we're, we're, we're thinking about food a lot during the day and we're not eating because we're using willpower at times to not eat. And because we're using willpower, that takes so much energy and effort to override what's happening in our mind and in our body. So when we have the thought, I just like food more than other people, and we feel desire to eat, and then we try to counteract that by not eating with willpower, it's like this is the normal pattern that would happen when we have that. But then when we're like, oh, I need more willpower, I need to not eat. We try to like pause it here. We're like, oh, we're going to like stop and not do that. And so we're like, it can, feels like, can feel like we're battling with ourselves because we are. We're like, I don't want to change my thought. I'm just going to try to change my action without actually changing what's happening in my mind. And so if we're, especially for those of us that are good at that at times, we might be able to do that, but we end up exhausted. And so inevitably at some points, we run out of willpower. Like we actually have so much, only so much willpower that we can have. It's not like some people just have like an intense amount of willpower. It's just where we direct it. And so if you're spending so much of your willpower and energy and effort on not eating and not actually changing what's happening in your mind in the evening, like of course your, your brain's just going to be like, absolutely not. I've been trying to like control myself all day. I've been trying to like get out of this all day. And now I just like, I just don't care. I don't have energy, any energy and effort left. But what I want you to see is that if you didn't have this thought, you wouldn't need any energy and effort. You wouldn't need to battle against yourself because it would become just who you are. And then it becomes so easy and so much more effortless. Okay, so Danielle said, food helps me feel safe, kind of like combating a feeling of scarcity. Yes, so Danielle, this is especially scarcity around food, and I think about um, food and scarcity. I think it's so interesting because for the first time, really, in our human existence, like, us now, we don't really need to worry about food being scarce in the same way we did throughout all of humanity. Like I think about, I have a grandmother who is 99 and she lived through times of ration. She lived through times of there genuinely not being enough food for people to eat. And so that scarcity always served us in the past. And when we think about living in caves and we think about very you know, a long time ago, our ancestors, there genuinely wasn't enough food. And so we're brains are programmed to think that way when it comes to food, because for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, that's what we've been doing. And it's been serving us. But for the first time, really, we don't have scarcity around food. Like when we think about it, and I'm not talking about if we don't have enough money to actually buy food, but I'm talking about our ability to be able to go to the store and get more food for most of us. And our ability to like order groceries online and get food, our ability to just like get in the car and go get food. We're not living in the same world that we were for thousands of years where it really served us to feel scarce around food. So then you take our grandparents, our parents, all of that throughout human history, like our brains actually evolved that way because it kept us alive for so long that then, right? And then if you grew up anything like me, it was like, you got to clean your plate, you got to clean your plate always. And it was like, you got to eat when there's food. And like, it was just a, it's just a very different mentality, but it had a purpose and it really served us for so long. But now where we are in our humanity, 
that doesn't serve us anymore because food's around us so often and in such abundance. And so then we have this scarcity when food is actually around us and it is so abundant that we find ourselves in this like tense graspiness to eat. And I will even see it come up for me sometimes, like even, and then I'll kind of walk you through what you can do with that, is like even last night, like, and now I can just, it's like I, it's like I watch what's happening in my brain from a different perspective rather than being in it. And this is what I want you to start to do for yourself is that you have those thoughts. And so I want you to separate yourself from it. And the most powerful way is to do this on paper. And so you can even just write down all of your thoughts about food. But for me last night, so my husband was working a little bit later than he usually did. So I was having dinner with the kids and we were having, we had steak and beets and cauliflower. And so we're eating. And it's interesting because sometimes my kids have no interest in me and sometimes they really do and we don't eat meat every day. And so, but like steak, they like love. So both of them are eating like so quickly and so into it. And usually the two of us are there and like we're both cutting up the meat for the kids. And so I found myself like cutting up the meat and just like watching it go down and down and down as they were eating it. And I could see my brain being like, quick, we got to eat quick. We got to eat quick. Don't miss out on this as if I would, there wasn't like a plenty of food. And so I could even see not only is there enough food in front of me, and then even as that went away, I could see like my brain being like, what? We need to eat like right now. But I also was like, and also we have a ton of food in the refrigerator, not even food I need to prepare. It's like already prepared because of how we make food in our house. And so I could just like watch my brain kind of freak out. And so what I want you to do, especially if you have scarcity around food, is to see what goes through your mind when you're eating. And it's and oh, some good ways to kind of cue into it that now I see for myself is not only do, can I watch it happen, can I watch it, can I observe it, but if I find myself like eating and eating and eating and like not talking to my husband, not really looking at my kids, I'm just like, oh, hang on what's happening. And it's usually some of those thoughts. Or now for me, it's kind of like, I got a quick eat before my daughter like really wants to get out of her high chair. And the other thing with, I'm just going to have a heater in my office because I get cold and it's getting warm. Um, the other thing when it comes to scarcity around food is we will sometimes tell ourselves like, I have scarcity around food. And it feels like really big. Like I have this um, like boogeyman of like scarcity. Like I have scarcity thoughts. I have a scarcity belief system around food. I can feel really, really big. And so what I want you to do to start to unwind that is to just get really specific in a really specific example when you had some of those thoughts. So Pick a time, you can run a model and see for you what's going through your mind. So if you have, Danielle, a specific example that you can tell me, you can type that in and I'll kind of put, pull that out for you. And I was actually thinking, I think going forward, we might do, if you want, we can do live coaching so we can have a conversation, which is really the most powerful way to do it, have that conversation so we can walk through that together. So what I want you to see is that... There are thoughts you have and the way you break down like a belief system, if you are like, I have a belief system even around like money and your body image and food and all of these things is one at a time. I like to think about it like Jenga, you know, the like have all the little, what do you call them? Wooden blocks that you build the tower and you each pull one out at a time that you pull one out at a time and eventually the whole thing comes crumbling down. But you, it's, you can't with our thoughts just like knock the whole thing down. It really is like picking one at a time. So if you're like, okay, I know I feel scarce. I think it's really important to remember so you're not beating yourself up of like, I evolved this way. Like there is, there is some human um, like pre-programming that that's how we survived, that that is kind of innate in some of us. And so it's like, okay, well, if that's part of my biology, I have to recognize that so that I can change what I'm thinking and change what I'm believing. And so what you want to do is really see, oops, sorry, didn't turn my phone off. Um, scarce, it's oftentimes of like a thought like there's not enough, food's going to run out. 
I need to eat right now. Some of those like really like kind of sort of thoughts that produce that feeling of scarcity. So I want you, Danielle, to ask for yourself, like, what's going through your mind that's causing you to feel scarce? And so I'll give you my thoughts. If you can type yours, I'll use yours. But otherwise, I'll walk you through what was happening for me last night. It was like, what happened is I, it triggers for me, like the, when I find myself thinking it is when I see, I see like one steak gone. Okay. So like, it's very um, factual. Like we would say there were two steaks and now there's one. Like if we were all there, we would all agree there's two. Now there's one. My two kids ate it. Okay. So my thought is like, there won't be enough. And it's not even just not even enough steak, but there won't be enough food for me to eat. And so what happens then for most of us is we're like, there's not gonna be enough and we feel really scarce that then we start to eat quickly, like really quickly. Almost like for me, it's like a frantic eating. And then isn't it so interesting? What happens is there's no food left. Like when you really think about it, and a couple other things happen, but we have this thought, there's not gonna be enough food to eat, we feel really scarce, we literally eat all the food. And so the result we create is there's no food left. And then our brain is like, see, there's no food left. And it can almost feel scarce even after we've eaten. And that's what causes a binge very often is we're like, see, there's not enough, there's not enough, there's not enough. And so what we do is we're like, we, <laughs> we eat it. And I, I only like giggle is because I did this all the time. And it's just like, this is how wild our brains can be at times when we're not aware of what's happening. And like, this is exactly what I did. It was like, there's not enough. I need to eat it. And I need to eat it right now. And I would eat it frantically and quickly. So not only would I not enjoy it, I would not escape whatever I was trying to escape because that emotion is still there. And then I would eat all the food. So there's no food left. So it's like my thought there won't be enough food for me to eat. I literally just proved it true by eating all the food. Like, I want you to like really think about that and really see that, that our scarcity thoughts, whatever they are, but just pick one. When we're feeling scarce, we literally create more scarcity. We literally create no more food because we just ate it all. And so then our brain is like, see, there's not enough food left. And it just becomes this like self-fulfilling cycle we do is we're like, see, there's not enough food. And then the result, it just kind of goes back up because then we have another model where our circumstance is now zero steaks. Let's say I ate all the steak, zero steak. And then my thought is like, see, there's not enough food. And then I feel scarce. And then I go eat a different food. And then the result I create is eating all of that food. And that's how it can often work with a binge. There's many ways that works with a binge, but a binge is like, we have some of that thought. And then once we eat that, we carry that same thought to the next set of food. And then we carry the same thought to the next set of food. And so what I want you to see is that it's not because I saw one steak gone. It was that I had the thought there's not enough food for me to eat. Because then what happens is like, I want you to observe it and see it and recognize what that feels like in your body. So that then what we say is you like interrupt it here, you like put a pause and you can just watch yourself without acting it out. So then I just kind of watched myself have some of these thoughts and I was like, oh, of course that's why I'm feeling this way right now is because I'm having the thought there's not gonna be enough. And so now, because I've done it so frequently with food, I was like, there's plenty of food. There's food in the refrigerator. My husband might not even want it. Like, I'm going to eat a little bit. Like, my kids don't need to eat anymore. Like, I just all of a sudden was able to, like, recognize it and then be, like, kind of calm myself, calm my own brain down and, like, it's okay. We're going to survive because this is such a, especially with food, it's such an innate, like, I need food to live that when we have these thoughts around food, it can literally feel like we're going to die if we don't eat, if we don't eat, because that's how we survive for so long. 
And so then you start to see what's happening in your brain and then you can start to shift it. But when we're first starting to do this work, you really do it after it's happened so that then you recognize what was happening. You like do a model to understand what was happening then. And then you can start to recognize it, like I was saying, in the moment before I overate. And then you can, can really do the work to just kind of make some of those go away permanently. And it's a little bit like, like, you know, when someone jumps out at you and it's like, you have that initial, like, holy shit, like terror feeling in your body. And then you're like, oh, see, it's just my kid. Oh, see, it's just my kid. It's like, you kind of calm, calm your brain down by like reassuring it with that very human logical part of your brain. It's like calming down that child, like primitive part of our brain of like, we're okay. It's not a tiger just my kid jumping out at me. It can be the same thing when we have some of those really high emotion thoughts around food. So that like freaking flew by. So the other thing I was going to say for you, for those of you that were writing down thought errors is the two things I want you to do if you want to take this and continue this for yourself is like write down all of your thoughts about food and then go back through and I want you to see which ones serve me, if any, and what do I want to believe around food? Some of the things that I love to believe around food is that there's always enough. I'm totally fine when I'm hungry. There will always be another meal for me to make a different choice at. There's always tomorrow that I don't like feeling stuffed. I don't like feeling full. I'm just a person that just eats until I'm satisfied. And so those thoughts serve me in a much more powerful way, but I want you to see what are all of the thoughts that you have that feel really real and really true. Do they serve you? Could they be just thought errors? Are you willing to let them go? And then what thoughts do you want to believe about yourself? And things that are not like rainbows and daisies land. We talked about believing new thoughts on a, on a different call of these, that you want it to be something you can believe right now. And so a lot of times there's like a bridge there that's like, it's possible I could be someone that doesn't want to feel full. Like you might not believe that I'm someone that doesn't want to feel full, but it could be possible. There are other people. And it's like you just kind of step out of all of these thoughts that you've been believing for so long. So I hope you all have an amazing weekend. And if you, I've gotten a few questions about working with me and what that is like. So I work with women one-on-one -on -one and we really do this work and get really specific and really customize what we're doing to get you to your goal in a way that's permanent. So we do all of the thought work so that all of the action becomes easy and effortless. And I like to think about being thin is just being naturally thin is just being in a body that you love to be in. And when you've developed that thought patterning, when you've done that rewiring in your brain with your relationship with food and your relationship with yourself, then nothing else matters because you get to take that with you wherever you go. So then your action might change, but because you have that same thought patterning and that thought patterning is what become what comes on autopilot as opposed to the old thought patterning, it becomes so easy and so effortless and then you don't need willpower because it just becomes a part of you. So if you're interested in working with me, you can go to lauradixoncoaching.com. There's a work with me tab. You can schedule a consultation if you want to learn more and we can talk there. And I hope you all found this super helpful. And if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot me an email or let me know and I'd be more than happy to help you out. I'll talk to you all later.